Hello? Hi, is this Cam? It is indeed. All right. Well, let me do the official introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very excited to welcome our featured guest for this evening. He is an actor. You know his voice from many, many characters, although they all sound a little bit different. He's also a producer. He's a singer. And he's from a family that is Hollywood royalty. We are very excited to welcome the one and only Cam Clark to the show. You're on the air with Terry and Tiffany. Welcome. Hi, kids. How are you? <laughs> so great to have you on. You know, Tiffany's got a day job. She's my daughter and the other host here. And she happened to mention who we have on the show because she just like talk and shop talk. We found out how many nerds <laughs> were at work with my daughter <laughs> because they all got super excited over, over you. You're like the king of cartoons. <laughs> well, if, if not the king, perhaps the duke. <laughs> Wow, there, there's so many facets to you, Cam. I mean, you could have went so many different ways. I mean, growing up and being on the King Family TV show, being part of that legendary family, and then your, your father being the great movie legend he is. I definitely want to talk about Robert, one of my favorites, uh, filmmaker and actor. But what was it that made you turn the way you did and really kind of go into being, like we say, the Duke of Cartoons? <laughs> turn the, the way I did. <laughs> yeah. Turn the way I did. Um, uh, be more specific. Be more specific. Would it turn the way I did? You mean okay. um, as far as going did, into voice acting versus? Yeah. I mean, you could you could have been you could have been an on screen actor more so. You could have gotten into to being a singer. I mean, you've dabbled in a little bit of all of this. But why yeah, the well, focus on um, voice acting? Uh, because because <laughs> it's the only <laughs> one that wanted me. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, I try. You know, uh, a lot of. Child performers, uh, for whatever reason, can't uh, don't cross over, um, and I certainly tried, uh, but I, I couldn't get arrested on camera. I did a couple <laughs> of pilots, um, but nothing, nothing, nothing happened. And um, I was actually um, had planned since that wasn't working out. Uh, I had gone back to school to. Uh, Parsons Design School. Um, I uh, the, they're from New York, and the first year they bought there was a, we had a art school here called Otis, mm -hmm. and it became Otis Parsons, and it was it's a design school out here in L.A. And I wanted to be an illustrator of children's books, kind of thing. And then I found out that art school is hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just art; it's hard. Um. And my brother, Rick, uh, while I was in school here, uh, he had a job. He was director of post-production at Warner Brothers TV. Mm -hmm. And he would call me in from time to time to do some voiceovers on uh, some of the shows he was working on. And it kind of was like a little, you know, Cinderella story. I... Uh, Met some a uh, couple of actors on a job. This uh, husband and wife, uh, the woman especially was, uh, she was like the it girl in her day. Her name was Linda Gary. She did just about every cartoon in the seventies. Mm -hmm. um, and we were on the session together, and she says, "You know, you're 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 pretty good at this. Uh, have you you know thought about you know maybe pursuing this?" And I kind of. You know, gently said, <laughs> well, thank you, but, but you know what, I'm going to be a movie star, so thank you for the offer. <laughs> and, and she kind of said, okay, well, in the meantime, and she and her husband, Chuck Howerson, they, like, took me under their wing and set me up with a coach and introduced me to their agent, and I just never looked back. And I still kept an on-camera agent, but rarely booked anything. And finally, I just was like, okay, well, that's not going to happen for me as much as I would like it. And I closed the door to that and strictly focused on the, the voice thing. And, um, you know, go, 
go go towards the light. Right, right. Um, well, it wasn't that you know you didn't add uh, uh, to your resume some really cool credits because you were on some real classic TV. I mean, Perry Mason and all of that. I mean, Perry Mason, what? Well, according to IMDb. Harry Mason? Yeah. How old do you think I am? I don't know. <laughs> IMDb obviously got it wrong. <laughs> that IMDb often IMDb got a lot of things wrong. Um, like the picture they use of me on there is atrocious. I mm-hmm. look like I look like a, a, a Liberace <laughs> after death. <laughs> and I could not get them to remove it. Wow. I, really? A lot of actors, they complain that you know, there's some, it's like some secret somebody that drops all these credits on your IMDb, and it's like, I've never done it. I don't do it. Well, the they problem is... magically it, show up. Right. People, I guess, like, users can actually put stuff in. Like, well, that and know. on Wikipedia, too. Yeah. So, that that's what makes the problem there. But, you oh, know, if somebody yeah. says Perry Mason, like I did mistakenly, they also made Perry Mason revival movies back in the 80s, so that, that wouldn't necessarily say you're sold. Yeah, well, um, you know, it's funny... I sometimes I play with my friends. I go, okay, ask Siri, how what is Cam <laughs> Clark's net worth? <laughs> and uh, I will tell you and all of your listeners that according to Siri, I'm worth ninety million dollars. <laughs> wow! Just saying. Well, there you go. And then you and and then you ask twenty minutes later, and it's. He's worth one million dollars. It's like who's even tallying? <laughs> who's making these numbers up? Who has my who has my bank book that I'm? Who, who's been peeking at when I go to the ATM machine? <laughs> well, I think you made the right choice because voiceover work is actually a profession. You can get paid to have multiple personalities, so it worked out really good. And I do. <laughs> <laughs> now I understand. Lots of imaginary friends. I understand, and unless you know the internet was wrong about this, but but one of your kind of mentors that you were taught by was Michael Bell. Is that correct? That one is correct. So I mean, what was it like being being mentored by somebody who who was so established and, and, and amazing in the industry? Well. I, I I mean maybe it's the the good news is I I didn't know that right I just was pointed in this direction and that went, and um, I I took a class of his an animation class and he was a marvelous teacher marvelous because he didn't uh, whitewash anything and he didn't give anybody you know like just oh hey that's great next he would go nope. Nope, nope. You know, until mm-hmm. you turned in something uh, that was close. And when I got with the agent that I've been with for about 30 years now, Gulp, when she met me, she like, I mean, I was signed and she like pokes her head in while I'm recording in the, doing an audition. She pokes her head in and she kind of looks me up and down. Rita Venari of mm-hmm. Sutton Barth and Venari, who I had Dort, one of my dearest, and she says, you kind of sound like a young Michael Bell, mm. and she kind of gives this nod and this smirk, and it's like, okay, I can work with this. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were so certainly I, on, I, uh, you were certainly on some very big my shows. Best Michael Bell impersonation. There you right. go. Uh, you know, I have to tell you the years. funniest stories. I, I was... At a festival one time, and they had uh, Flo and Eddie from the Turtles, the classic 60s group. And this father, who had like every Turtles album, he wanted him to sign the albums and everything, brought up his little kid to introduce him to, to Eddie of Flo and Eddie. And he was like, son, this is one of the Turtles. And the kid was all confused. He was like, are you Leonardo or are you... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. But the Turtles have definitely become you know, part of our, our, our mainstream and and classic animation for sure but you know i wanted to find out about the king family because you were on that tv show and you were the youngest member of the clan am i right i was the oldest of the youngest okay uh, there were uh seven little little kids there were a group of teenagers and there was a group of children and i was the leader of these seven little little tiny little rugrats little <laughs> tiny tots who they, you know, march in on the show at the beginning and the end, and we do little songs in between, like, 
Alfalfa or Shirley Temple. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I was uh, six years old when we started that show. And um, yeah. Well, you were lucky you could sing because when Tina was on the show, she told me it was a family practice that if somebody was born into the family and they couldn't sing, they would kill them. <laughs> Yeah, we call it we we call it mercy killing. <laughs> but everybody's been pushing me to ask you because Tina had slightly mentioned it, and she wanted me to ask you. And we're still getting messages of people wanting to ask you. There is hopes that you're going to be producing a King Cousins reunion of some type. Or is a that tribute, true? A tribute. A yeah. tribute. Is that true? And and how far have you gotten what? with that? Any light? Yeah. Okay. And I'm also and I'm also worth ninety million dollars. <laughs> I kind of think this might be true because oh, I know you oh, have a definite okay, love okay. for that. We did a ton of rehearsals. We were doing with Tina and her sister Kathy and two of our other cousins, Susanna and Jenny, mm -hmm. were mounting a tribute to the King Sisters, actually, where mm -hmm. we had uh, uh, my wonderful music um, arranger, a guy named Troy Dexter, he took, none of the charts of the King Sisters arrangements exist, you know, they're okay. wherever in, the, in a landfill a hundred years ago. So he would do these takedowns just by ear of these jazz uh, arrangements, you know, and just pull apart the parts and write them out for us. And we rehearsed for about a year and a half and then COVID. Yeah. Right. Um, I mean, we had a theater, we were set to go. Wow. And now we've been down for, you know, all of COVID. So, you know, who knows what's... Uh, nobody knows yet what live theater is going to look like right. whenever it comes back. Um, so um, that's... I'm, I'm sorry to say it's kind of shelved until... Right. Uh, until anybody knows anything. Right. Well, you know? I, I know Tina's really hoping it's going to happen, and I can imagine you are too, because there's one thing I've definitely noticed about you and looking at your Facebook is, is you know, you've done so many things, your famous father, and, and of course your famous mother, and, and all the, the things you've done with the voices and everything, but you have a really love, a really serious love for that King family thing, and and this would be great if you could get it going. Yeah, I um, the people love my little clips, and I share my old stories and stuff. And um, it's been wonderful to hear people's, you know, memories of us. And it's it's shocking to me how what people remember for many of our shows never reran. You know, back in the '60s, they ran in the summertime, but it's not like they lived on like you know, the Partridge family yeah. or whatever, they, they, they were never aired again. Right. And people, I'll, I'll put up a clip and do a backstory on it, and uh, they go, I remember that. And it's like, how do you remember that? It You know, it was 50 years ago. But uh, obviously it uh, had an impact for a lot of folks. Well, you definitely dabbled in the, in the singing after it. Did you not put out uh, some digital download music. I think there was like a Christmas album or something. Am I right? Yeah, I did two albums. One is a Christmas album called Homeward. And another one is an album of uh, of love songs called Inside Out. Mm. And it was a lot of fun getting in the studio because Tina sings on uh, one of the Christmas cuts and then my brother Ricky and Kathy, who were also with the King family, we mm -hmm. did a, a, a version of Tennessee Christmas that Amy Grant had a, you know, is famous for. Awesome. Um, so, uh, and this last Christmas, um, I don't know if Tina mentioned this to you, I, I usually have this Christmas party that's a, everybody piles into the living room and it's, uh, there's all singing and solos and carols and you know Christmas readings and stuff and since we couldn't gather I did it online mm. and uh, uh, it was a love you know a lot of blood sweat and tears but I'm really happy with the way it turned out and it's it's out there for all the world to see is that on YouTube or uh, where's that at 
Uh, it's on uh, on my YouTube. My nephew who runs my site tells me I have my own YouTube, so I just believe him. <laughs> um, uh, it's it's called uh, Snow Globe. S N O. New word G L O B E. Snow Globe 2020. And if you look that up, you can see pieces of it. But I do this one number of the King Sisters singing White Christmas and all of us kids sing along with them in, you know, like you've seen a lot of people have seen these things over COVID where people record separately right, and their yeah. images are from their living room right, or their right. bedroom. And amaz- amazingly and it works. I, I don't know how. It is crazy. It works. Uh, I mean, Well, there is some smoke and mirrors, but it still is, uh, it's people do record from where they are. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's tricky because not everybody has a sound studio, you know, they're <laughs> in their bathroom <laughs> right. or you know, sitting on their bed, but yeah. I'm really proud of how it came out. And um, yeah, Snow Globe 2020, and uh, a great thing we did with singing with the Kiss King Sisters doing White Christmas. And um, yeah, very proud of it. Very, very pleased with it. Well, I've even saw you uh, dabbling into some music with the Turtles. Now, I, there was, I was four of you there. And you guys were singing the Ninja Turtle theme, which was really, really cool. But did you guys not do some kind of a stage production, too? Well, I mean, there has been so many incarnations of the Turtles. Mm -hmm. um, And all with different casts. Uh, My group of Turtles, we did not do a stage show. I mean, we've, when we, we, you know, do the Comic-Con circuit and... Sometimes they have us get up on stage and, you know, maybe somebody has posted when we mess around because we all happen to sing, the four of us. And when we we came together a couple of Christmases ago to do, uh, golly, what car company was it? Can't remember. So, uh, there was a car company that did this holiday ad where saying, what was your favorite thing to open for Christmas in the 80s? And the campaign was with all these action figures. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So they got the four of us back together to do these uh, TV spots. And we just started messing around and we sang, speaking of the turtles, we just in at the studio, we started riffing on uh, Happy Together by <laughs> the original turtles. <laughs> and that that kind of went crazy online. I mean, we're just we were just hanging out in the studio and just kind of like, you know, bebop and snapping our fingers, singing, just riffing around on the song, just being silly. And uh, so, yeah, a lot of people like, what the, the turtles doing the turtles? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's classic. I love it. I absolutely so love it. Let me ask you, Cam, because I was just, I'm curious. We've had a, a lot of uh, talent actors on that started out when they were, you know, very young, like you did at the age of six. And we hear varying stories from people as far as how they got involved, if mom and dad came to them, asked them what they thought, or if it was just kind of like, you know, well, mom and dad are in the business, so it's assumed you're going to be in the business too, kid, go ahead. Now, Tina had said, you know, that she was already, you know, acting and things like that before the King Cousins was formed and became a thing on the King Family Show, but what about for you? I mean, did, did did your mom come to you and talk it over with you, or was it just kind of assumed that this is what you would do because... No, it, it, well, the, the, Tina's mother, as you know from the, your interview with her, created had this idea for the show, mm-hmm. and when it, when ABC decided to make a pilot of it or before that when we were just doing the stage show of it this little just for a fundraiser thing King Sisters and their children um, it's just kind of like you know some mothers and fathers go kids we're going camping (laughs) and other parents go kids we're going to be on national television (laughs) and it was kind of I mean it's just it's just what we did right um you know that and i was so little it was just like okay okay you know as far as the teenagers go um obviously they're older and enough and they're you know cognizant enough to go wait what but everybody went okay (laughs) i I could almost Um, see an argument between your mother and father because your mother was in music and your father was in filmmaking and i could just see your father go 
What does he want to be a singer for? <laughs> he should be <laughs> into making these movies like I make, and it'd be like a little battle. Was there ever any of that? No, they couldn't. They were so supportive of whatever I wanted to do, whether it was music or, or you know, acting or my artwork. You know mm-hmm. that um, I pursued and um, produced a couple of things uh, of children's books. Um, and line of greeting cards. So, you know, I did a lot of self-starting stuff, but it was the voice stuff that, that uh, um, you know, obviously is, is what took off and is, you know, has put me in the, um, the little history book. Well, I know definitely, you know, with, with the way you respect your family, it had to be a real honor because you got to do something that was very, very unique, and that is you actually got to do your father's voice because there was some kind of a, a film project put together that was based on your dad's film, The Hideous Sun Demon, and you got to uh, voice him. Tell us about that and how that happened and, oh, and what I mean that by that. That was crazy. Yeah. What was that called? What did they call that? I think oh, they ended oh. up calling it What's it was, Up, Hideous Sun Demon. Yeah, What's Up, Hideous Sun Demon, which was an homage to What's Up, Tiger Lily, right? which was a Woody Allen film where he had taken some goofy old movie and revoiced it, mm-hmm. uh, which is done often. You know, I mean, there's lots of improv uh, troops where they'll play a movie and they'll uh, talk along with it without the sound and they'll make up new, you know, stuff. And these guys wanted to do that with Dad's movie. And they went, well, you kind of look like your dad and we need some extended footage to, for our new story. And so they had me do some on-camera stuff as well. Um, and uh, it was a real low-budget, you know, just rinky-dink thing. But I was like, you know, what the hey? Mm-hmm. And um, so, yeah, extended it and then did uh, dubbing of changing the script. And I, I honestly don't even remember how they changed it or what happened to it. But um, it, was, it was a lot of fun. Now, if my notes are correct, your your dad was alive then, and you would ask him about it, and he gave his blessing. Is that right? Sure. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Were you nervous when he uh, saw it? No. No. I mean, it was all in the day's work, and uh, dad did not like uh, uh, how his career went. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and he started doing the the you know autograph circuit before comic con you know became this institution yeah uh and you know he wanted to be a legit actor and it never really happened yeah he kind of got and trapped in the so b movie thing he got into b try b minus and c you know these rinky dink horror flicks mm-hmm. uh from the 50s and even though they were cult classics and when people my age found out who my father was they they were like oh my god that's your dad that movie scared me so much i love that movie. you know <laughs> but he hated it oh. he absolutely hated it well it's um, too bad because he, something like that you know it's, it's kind of like a edwood plan nine it was kind of like a throwaway film and a lot of people thought it was stupid and cheap or whatever but people love it because it's got legs it's got lives people a hundred years from now will be talking about it yeah, well, that wasn't what he was after. He yeah. wanted to be taken seriously, and um, in fact, they did a trip at the, at the Egyptian theater here in uh, Hollywood a few years back. They did a tribute to uh, what's the director of um, uh, um, uh, um, Beyond the Time Barrier, Ulmer. Ulmer, what's his name? First name. It, Ulmer, we're we're actually, looking it up sorry. here. I, I doesn't cross my mind. Anyway, he... I, I know what film you're talking about, though. Yeah, he was a... He became... He had quite the name within that genre. Yeah, Edgar, uh, Edgar genre. Ulmer. Edgar Ulmer. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Um, I don't know what his other titles were, but I know he was a somebody. And so uh, they had Dad come and speak at this thing at the, you know, the iconic, famed Egyptian right, theater, and right. we were all there, and on the big screen, they... They're, you know, showing his movies, and he got up there for maybe, you know, 15 minutes, 
you know, and people, you know, all kinds of hands went up to ask questions and he was done. And I, it was just like, wow, dad, these people love you. Right. But he was like, okay, that's all we got time for. Mm. <laughs> so, and, and, you know, the, the older one gets and option, you know, and the chances for your dreams to come about, uh, it's hard. You go, okay, it's, it's, now it's really never going to happen. Yeah. Right. Um, and it just wasn't, he just, it didn't turn him on. It was like, I'd rather, you know, I don't want to. You know, and then there's somebody and I, like, and I respect it. I respect yeah, it. No, yeah, no, absolutely. I, sure. I absolutely see your your father's side of it, but to somebody like me that lives and, and breathes these drive-in films, I still have the issue of Famous Monsters of Filmland with the hideous sun demon on the cover. I mean, to I me, I have that framed in my bathroom. <laughs> All right, <laughs> that very cover. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, I, I know, like he was kind of disenchanted. And I, I got to say. I gotta say, Go I had, there's this there's this collector. And I, forgive me, I can't remember his name. This okay. sci-fi collector, who somebody found out who I was and introduced me to him, and he had the original mold of the mask of the hideous sun demon. Oh wow! And I was presented as a gift. Oh. He you know it he he poured he poured had a had a had a mold poured you know poured another one. And it's because it was poor, you know, a mold of a mold. It's right. too mm-hmm. small to put on your head. So, yeah. but it's poured from the original. And I was very misty that this guy. This is a guy who, you know, he made a fortune. He bought. He was able to buy Robbie the robot, mm-hmm. um, and he had just all kinds of other stuff. And he made a killing wow. when he decided it was time to sell his, yeah. you know. Uh, this science fiction collection that he had. Because yeah. uh, when we were kids, science fiction was for kids. And it was always, you know, the red-headed stepchild. And now, you know, you can't swing a dead cat without hitting a superhero. And yeah. it's like, um, it's all, that's all like top, top of the, you know, top notches, science fiction. Right. But back, you know, Flash Gordon was not top of the heap. Back in you know in the '30s, it was serial. Um, but you know, things changed. When you were talking about this famous collector, were you by chance talking about Bob Burns? Now you've gone and asked me for somebody's name. <laughs> um, well, I was just curious because I believe he didn't he yeah, Bob own Burns, Robbie the yes, Robot. Bob Burns has Robbie the yeah. Robot. Whether it's the Robbie the Robot right, or not, then, yeah. does, I don't know. Does he live in L.A.? Yes. He lives in Burbank. Yeah, because the guy I'm talking about, and I'm really embarrassed I can't think of his his name. Um, he and I don't know if he actually followed through with this. He said I sold a bunch of this stuff for umpty million billion dollars, whatever, and I'm moving to Scotland. Oh, and I'm um, I'm. He also had some big computer uh, that was used in a few films in. Again, I'm a bad... Probably Hell 9000 from uh, right? 2001 in <laughs> Space Odyssey. I don't know. I'm not well, sure. No, it was no, it was some old... Uh, it was like a wall. I think it was also used in uh, Tracy and Hepburn's... Was it Desk Set? Mm. And this thing was just repurposed many times to be one of those... Beep, boop, 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 right. You know, big, big wall computers. Right, right, yeah. And he had this wall. Um, that was built, I guess, whenever Tracy and Hepburn did their stuff, you know, early 50s, mm-hmm. late 40s. Wow. wow. Well, I, I'm really sad that, that your father was unhappy with the way things went. I, could, I totally see his side. But, you know, the only thing I could say to your father, if I could talk to him, is to be known for something is better than to be known for nothing. And to me, he was a legend. He really was. Well, thank you. I, I wish he could have seen it that way, yeah. but... Well, Such was not the case. Well, me, I understand me, you kind of have a similar situation in the fact, uh, unless this quote is incorrect, like I said, so many of, you know, people's notes and that the internet has so many things that are wrong. Uh, and, and other people have told me, you know, well, that's the way it is, but you can't go back and change it. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. 
But it said that uh, one of, of course, the things that you do is do voices for computer games. And you said that you're from a time, of course, you know, growing up in the 50s and stuff, to where that wasn't a thing, that you're not a big fan of computer games. Is that video right? Video games. Vi uh, video games, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, video games, Dad. <laughs> computer games. It was at my time. I'm like, you, I'm your age. Okay. <laughs> That's like when they call game cartridges, they call them tapes. I hate it when people say that, but it's not correct. But but I, I guess it's not your thing, huh? No. No. I mean, I've played Pong. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That's about, and I, and I, I love me some pinball. Yeah. You know? But, um, and also growing up, I didn't care who voiced a cartoon. I could care less. You know, right. even Mel Blanc. I, I don't care. I didn't care. We didn't, that wasn't a thing, you know? Whether it was watching Hanna Barbera or Warner Brothers or uh, Disney, whatever, they were cartoons. Right. I watched them on Saturday mornings or after school, and then I got on my bike and went out and played. It, I didn't, I didn't take it with me. Well, I must say, you're... The people we meet at the conventions, it's like oh, I know. We we are like God. Right. And, <laughs> oh, you 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 know you. I was an only child and watching you guys mm -hmm. da, 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 and um, you got me through some really hard times and you know I, I people are constantly saying you were my childhood you mm -hmm. know I get the fan letters and you know thank you for being the voice of my childhood right um, and I just over the years have come to accept that that is indeed a thing right. even though you know because I just have to accept it because it wasn't the thing for us well, you know, when cartoons I, I, were cartoons, and that and that's, that's that's all it was. When I first started speaking, I was talking about you getting into doing voice, and I said, "Became what you became." But but really, it was kind of funny that I've said that because you're very normal. Because I'm telling you, I'm comparing you hey, to some now. other. Well, I'm comparing <laughs> you to some other voice artists. We had a, a female voice artist is very well known for a very famous character, and she was in studio. And it became annoying because she never talked as herself. She would just constantly do the voice. <laughs> it was like she thought she was this character. We were ready to call the White Coats because... <laughs> <laughs> no, I will tell you, a lot of people... Well, I mean, it's actors, you know, please. Yeah. A lot of people don't, you know, it's like, you know, save some air for the rest of us. You know, I've, I've been in plenty of sessions where I want to go, dude, you got the job. We have toned it down right. about... <laughs> You know, you're hired, okay? Turn it off. Yeah. Right. Um, and I think perhaps had I been more of that cut from that cloth, maybe I'd have gone even further because there's a lot of tap dancing going on. A lot of people, when they enter the studio, they start dancing from the second they, you know, park their car. Exactly, right. yeah. And that's not been my, and, and I, I, that's not me. And I, I don't enjoy the dance. Um, I certainly am quick-witted. I, I wouldn't be, have the career I did if I didn't have a, you know, have a quick wit or, you know, whatever you want to call it. But I've never been one to entertain between takes. Exactly. Say. Yeah. It's got to be um, terrible to be a comedian because they're like, you should be funny all the time. Right. I mean. Well, yeah. I had one guy uh, I was on a show with for many years. And you know, tell, tell the same jokes. Yeah. And one time we were on a break and he said, he came over and I wasn't laughing, you know? <laughs> Thanks, Kim. Are, are you okay? <laughs> and I went, I, it's just like, are you, are you all depressed? You know, whatever. And I said, I'm fine. <laughs> I've just heard it already. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't think I had that nasty of a tone <laughs> I, I probably I, I made some better story that way yeah. I probably just went no I'm no I'm okay no. but my thought bubble is oh my god <laughs> we've heard this stop already you're killing me right right um but that's that's a, that's a dance and it gets people places yeah and I was didn't ever do I wasn't good at that dance right. well, didn't for, want to didn't want to really. for, for people that think you're a god yeah, and, and you know, I, ah. I I think on certain nights you probably are God, but but we <laughs> we we've got one particular fan, okay, and it's a, a person that works with my daughter, and uh, he's 
promises to be a better employee to my daughter, right. who's his boss, if you <laughs> answer the following questions. Yeah, so he actually asked a whole bunch of questions, but his his talk... And we promised you would give him a shout-out. <laughs> but Okay, I will, I, will, I will... Before you tell that, I will tell you that when Turtles was... Our Turtles was really big, my cousin, uh, Zan Conkling mm-hmm. Albright, who was also in Sun Demon, she was a little girl oh. in the Sun Demon... Um, she would have me record a message. She was a school teacher. She would have me record a message as Leonardo, um, <laughs> telling the kids to listen to Miss Albright and do whatever she says. <laughs> and that's how she got the kids, you know, uh, on her side was because Leonardo told them they better. Well, that's perfect. And that's brilliant, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and and a lot of my fans now are grown up, obviously, are grown up. They're right. like, they are now the people in charge. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I I booked this new uh, show that I can't, you know, mention the name or whatever. Okay. But uh, the, the gal that hired me, we were on Zoom, as everyone is now. She said, don't turn on your picture. And this guy that was to be the one, she was the, she was the big cheese. And he, but he was the one who was doing the hiring. And so we're on Zoom. My screen is black. Her screen is on. This uh, uh, producer guy is picture on. And I go, and she goes, hey, so-and-so, um, I got someone who wants to talk to you here. Now, I'm watching his picture. Mm-hmm. And I went, uh, Hey, Jack, I'm really looking forward to working with you on your show. I can't wait. Uh-oh, Krang and Shredder are on their way. And I did some little, you know, little tap dance of, you know, of Leonardo. And this is for a, a television series, like a live action thing. Right. And I'm, working, and I'm working in post-production on it. Anyway, I see him, and it's like, and he's this guy who's 45 or 40, whatever he is, years old. And he's like on a game show. I see him first. <gasps> his hands go up to his mouth. And I keep talking, and then his arms go up over his head, you know, elbows forward as as you do. Your hands are on the back of your head, elbows forward, and it was like Christmas morning. I went. <laughs> do you do you dig know it, Do you it. know how much ability you have to fuck with people? I mean, seriously, <laughs> you got you got power there, you know. Oh yeah, yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, some of, some of the questions that that Jesse, who's my employee, had mentioned, and also we've gotten some questions from other uh, listeners too, so I'll kind of filter them in. But Jesse's big thing is he's a big fan of Akira, uh, and uh-huh. he was he was talking about how uh, Kanita was was a huge role. Um, obviously, that's become like a cult thing from the from the eighties, and he right. he wanted to know right. when when you took that on. How did it feel? Was it heavy at the time? Were you, did you know, have any inkling how big that um, was going to be? No, and this is uh, this is like where I say I don't do the tap dance very well, and I'm sure I burst all kinds of bubbles. But, <laughs> you know, um, just to be honest, um, it's all in a day's work, you know. Um, I auditioned, and I got it. And it's it's not like you're at MGM and you've just been cast in uh, you know George Cooker's or you know Capra's next movie. It, it, it's not like oh I'm doing you know I'm opposite Judy Garland or I'm opposite <laughs> Cary Grant. Right. It's just I'm doing this dubbing job, and I showed up and I did it and I got my paycheck and said thank you very much. Right. Yeah, um, Tina told us so we it, would it, love you and, and you know something you are so damned honest and down to earth. Yeah, you're you're real. I like that. <laughs> so I'm sorry to say I don't have any like, and I got chills and I knew <laughs> this is to be the making of you know the you know change the course of rivers. It was just like okay, sign here. Okay, thanks. Gotta go. <laughs> have you ever because you do so many voices? Unlike this person that was in our studio that, that was known for one big voice. So I don't imagine she got confused. Did you ever get confused and do the wrong voice? Uh, no. But often, I mean, as a regular thing, uh, you are reminded what you did. Yeah. You know, okay. it's like you, you're on hiatus or whatever, or I'll show up. You know, video games often have these expansions, they call them. And I may not have worked on the game for a year or eight months or whatever. And, you know, you get a call going, hey, you got to come back for this. They're doing an expansion. And just 
it's just part of the thing. I go, okay, can you pull it up? What I did. Mm -hmm. So and I, um, I, and they pull it up, and I go, rip, 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 and I go, okay, is that there? We go, there we go, there we go. Okay, got it. Okay, let's roll. So I have a question that's just kind of I'm curious as to how it works because I know that with video games, it's kind of like it is with talking to like Siri or something like that. There's, there's depending on what you say or what you do, there's a lot of different reactions or responses that could be, you know, triggered. And I've always wondered with people that like, like the woman who voiced Siri, like what is the recording session like that for? I mean, you're not really recording a storyline from beginning to end. Are you just canning a bunch of random phrases and comments? But you well, actually watch you, the, the film, don't you? I mean, don't you, you would watch know, it? You would know better than I since I've never played them. Yeah. Um, in the early days of games, they were all just, uh, I don't know, what do they call it? Just uh, shooting games. Mm -hmm. And you literally, your script is, you say the same line slightly different ten times. Um, changing the name depending on who won that round. Right. Or how many hits you know how many how many aliens you hit you know change you change the numbers uh but like on metal gear solid um which was one of, is my biggest title and huge franchise um uh, uh uh it was like one of the script one of the first scripted games that had backstory and acting as opposed to just fight grunts and that's 10 kills you know kind of thing and um, so just scenes were were massaged slightly differently depending on what went on. And it was just like, you know, it was, it was almost just like being in acting class, you know, where, okay, you've done it this way. Okay, now let's, uh, now you've won. How does that work? Right. So it's just like really fun acting exercises to right. be you know, honest. Now, talking about uh, Metal Gear, because that was another one that, that got brought up a lot by, by the audience, uh, they had mentioned that uh, Snake was highly based on Kurt, supposed to be highly based on Kurt Russell's character from Escape from New York. Can you verify if that's true? And did they give you any directing tips based off of that when you were recording? I'm worth $90 million. <laughs> <laughs> That's this is the first I've heard of it. Really? I mean, he looks like Kurt Kurt Russell in Escape from New York. Um, but that that's the first I've heard of that. Let, let me throw this at you. This has got to be not true. But then again, the world is so crazy. Maybe it is true. It said you are a voice double for Matthew Broderick. That one is true. I'll be oh. damned. Really? Wow, that's crazy. Um, that was early in my career that started. Disney used to take uh, their hit movies, and they this is when there was still such thing as LPs, and and then you know and forty fives. Um, they would do recorded versions of their hit films with satellites. Um, and one of the first album job, you know, LP jobs that I got was for one of Broderick's first films. Uh, war games. Oh, and uh, which he did, which he did with what? Ali Sheedy, right? right. Yeah, it's yes. a great film. <clears throat> and I just started talking like Matthew Broderick. It was kind of a thing that I did. <laughs> um, you know, I'd say, Jennifer, how can anyone get a D in home ec? <laughs> and um, this was a voice that I used when I started out. You start finding who? What are the iconic sounds that I can do? And I ch it's like, okay, I can sound like Broderick. I can kind of do my take on Travolta or Stallone. Um, you know, the guys that were, had certain, you know, had very definite sounds. And I would, you know, it was always, I would joke around with Matthew Broderick. And I ended up covering for him in uh, the, one of the saddest of my stories is when uh, Jim Cummings, who is a if you know that name, mm -hmm. huge animation got Winnie the Pooh. He's Pooh. Yes. Um, yeah, wonderful guy. And he was over at Disney one day, and they were talking about Matthew Broderick doesn't want to come back to do the sequel to Lion King. Mm. And and Jim Cummings, who always carries a pair of drumsticks with him, he's rat a tat tatting on whatever's around him. 
He's just going ding 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 ding, and he goes, "Well, you know what? Cam Clark does a dead on Matthew Broderick." And they went, "Really? Okay." So they they called me in, but it's a thing like, well, if he hadn't been standing there and heard me messing around with it, right. you know, some day on some other job, who knows? But I showed up and I said, Kira. You are part of the circle of life. <laughs> One day, all this will be yours. <laughs> and and I was so excited to get to do the lead in a Disney film. Yeah. And then, uh, who's the actor that plays uh, the uh, not the warthog, the other the other uh, critter, the the, the little the like, meerkat thing, the meerkat, the meerkat guy. Um, he tells Brad Broderick that. Uh, he's going to miss, miss out on some hefty residuals and he talked him to coming back so I have recorded like three fourths of the film and then they told me that he was decided to come back so they re-recorded the whole thing with him but they preferred my singing voice. Sorry, Matthew! <laughs> you know what I was going to um, say? That, that could have gotten to a lot of legalities we had Crispin Glover on a few times and he loves to tell that story that he didn't come back for the Back to the Future sequel and they had another actor made up to look like him and he sued him and won. Oh. Yeah. Well, this, this, he, Matthew, no lawsuit, they let him do it but they kept me for the singing voice. Oh, in the there you sequel. go. So that was sweet and I did, there's a, not a, not a huge hit for, <clears throat> uh, as a cartoon but there was a film called Road to El Dorado and they they often hire us worker bees to do all the uh, pre work uh, to try the jokes out to uh, sit there with the storyboards mm -hmm. and the writers are all there and rather than pay the big money for their stars they have sound alikes and I was hired to be uh, one of my heroes uh, uh, Kenneth Branagh. Mm -hmm. Well, there you go. Um, who was one of the leads. And there was a gal there who was uh, Rosie Perez. Mm -hmm. And a guy there that was, um, um, shoot, what's his name? Um, the guy from Sh Sophie's Choice. <laughs> this is what happens when you're old. You know, <laughs> the guy who was in that movie with the girl with the thing. Okay. Yeah, who was in right. another film with the mustache <laughs> and the car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That guy. Yeah. What? Um, Kevin Klein. Kevin Klein. Okay. Right. And another guy was Kevin Klein. And we did for like a year and a half. We would get together and, and just do the script and go, you know what? That line, you know, and they we were part of the team that got to the polished, finished script when they brought in the actors. And a real treat for me was, and I had no ego about not wanting to do this. They said, would you be a reader off camera for when the actors come in mm -hmm. and feed them their lines because everybody comes in on their own it's not like a radio show right for features and i got to feed kenneth Branagh and kevin klein their lines oh, now at cool. the time it was again I, I, it was all in a day's work really but as i look back i'm able to cherish and i wish i could tell my younger self you know this is a big deal right <laughs> um well, knowing where you come from in, in space and time, I imagine it was a great honor to do Snoopy. Okay, that, at the time, I knew was I died and gone to heaven. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I knew it had to be that way. Well, that's Terry and I were laughing because I... Terry's Terry was born in the fifties. He's a baby boomer. I was I'm born, the same age as, as Cam. Yeah, I was born. I was born in the eighties, and so you know. But I was a girl, so I was you know watching you know Gem and things like that. I wasn't watching yeah. Teenage Mutant Ninja as much. But when I found out you did Snoopy, I was like, wait a minute, no, that's that's huge. This is huge. This is a big deal. <laughs> I I it was the feather in my cap. I. And that, you know, when you're younger, you think uh, things are going to go on forever. And I never took advantage because uh, Charles Schultz wasn't hands on. Mm -hmm. uh, Lee Mendelson was the producer who, right. who produced uh, Great Pumpkin and Shot on Christmas and everything, everything that they did, all the movies. So I didn't push to meet Sparky, as everyone mm -hmm. called him. Right, Charles. And I regret 
that I never got to meet my hero. Yeah. So, and and when I'm at Comic Cons, I tell kids that although I didn't care who voiced Warner Brothers or Hanna Barbera, or whatever, I had every doll, every comic book, every T-shirt that was Charlie Brown. Right. right. And um, t- t- why I didn't push to meet Schultz? I, again, I'm 26 years old, and you're going to live forever, and you don't have that that part of you that goes, things don't last forever, buddy. Yeah. You know. Uh, it, it, I, was I, there I, like I, I, that hesitation because? Like Tiffany's done some acting and, and uh, work like that, but there was one day she was on American Dreams and and Dick Clark showed up. Oh, cool! She was worried she'd get fired, but she well, yeah, had to meet Dick Clark. You know? I was a, I was a dancer on the show, and you know how it is. Everybody keeps their place. You're in holding, and he was the big producer behind the show. It was Dick Clark, and so when he would walk by, all of us peons were kind of like, oh, okay. and I was like, you know what? They can fire me. I'm never going to get this chance <laughs> to meet Dick yep. Clark. And I walked up and said, hi, Mr. Clark. I'm sorry to, to bother you, but I just wanted to get to meet you and shake your hand. Because you're not expected to be a fan. You're, you're an employee of production. And he was the nicest person I've ever met. And you know I was on American Dream? Were you? Awesome. I I did background voices. I I was the kid. I was you. Oh, wow. I was the wow. boy you. <laughs> Doing background voices, um, but I have met a couple of my idols, and as, as I said, when you're older, you appreciate things. And I went to the uh, um, sheesh, the museum uh, in Beverly Hills. Golly, people, I'm I'm old and I forget everything. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the Paley Museum, okay, yes. who would have all these Q and As, and they had a thing on a show that I lived for. I set my clock for was room 222 oh yeah yes. yeah karen valentine and I, I you beat me to it yeah. i got to meet karen valentine oh. and my line my opening line when i to break the ice with a celebrity and i don't do it a lot yeah but i just went i am unworthy to be standing in front of you <laughs> And it's a gr- it's always an icebreaker, yeah. and she was delightful. Oh, I did the same thing with went to a Q and A of West Side Story right before COVID, and because I knew the people who put it on, I got to be in the little pre party, and I was shake. I was you know wetting my pants. Yes. I was just shaking to be in the same little cocktail area at the museum as as uh, Rita Moreno mm-hmm. and George Chikira. Uh, uh, Ch- 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 yeah, Chikira. And again, I said, I am unworthy to be in your presence. And I mean, and I kind of mean it, you know, it's just a clever way of coming off, not like just a total dildo. Yeah. Um, and they were were always sweet. The only person that I met that was a dick Mm -hmm. was I stood in line on my birthday for about three hours to get a copy of a book autographed by Anne Rice. It was when the Vampire Chronicles first came out. And um, I, we, a bunch of friends, we all read, you know, the Vampire Lestat. Uh, right. All read those books together. And I waited in line. She did not even look up from her pen when she, you know, wrote her, uh, her name. And I didn't have the balls to go, it's my birthday. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was just next next right so i have always been we when we're at the comic cons and i notice all my brethren uh we're really good at giving people their due yeah you know um i know i i have people that i'm a fan of and i've had my i had my feelings hurt by her flip side of that was uh um joan walsh anglin does that name ring a bell to either of you no no not to me she was an author and illustrator of children's books okay. back wow. in the '60s. Okay, and I met and I met her at a signing, and I bawled my eyes out, <laughs> bawling. And she says, and, and at this point, she's got an ample bosom and a long gray braid, you know. And she says, "Come here," and she just pulls me in Aww. to her chest. Same thing with Della Reese. I did voiceovers on "Touched by an Angel." Oh God, I love Della Reese. Yeah. 
She'd and be- she'd come in and she'd say, Angel girl, and she'd talk like this. She had this kind of voice. <laughs> and she said, come in, give me a hug. You know? And it's wow. like, I'm in the bosom of Della Reed. Yeah. I can die. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it would have been cool. I, I guess she didn't get the role, but another show that was really important to me, did you not audition for the new adventures of Johnny Quest, Haji? Uh, uh, yeah, well, okay. Um, <laughs> I, that's always a, it's a great, it's a, it gets a big laugh when I'm on the road with the Turtles because it was my first job, my first series, and I told everybody, la, 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 and I was so excited, and I think I'd recorded a couple episodes, and then uh, Rita, my agent, tells me I've been replaced. Wow. Oh, I never asked why. Uh, but I was so disappointed. But yeah. I was replaced by Rob Paulson, mm. who is my dear friend who in, was in Turtles with me and uh, The Tick with me and, you know, all kinds of shows. And it always gets a big laugh when I mention that this guy sitting next to me stole my first job from me <laughs> <laughs> as, as, as Haji. Yeah. As Haji. Yeah. But that's okay because you ended up becoming He Man. So, I mean, you know, it's all in a day's work. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. So, so when you do yeah. He-Man, tell me you, you pump yourself up and you, just, <laughs> you feel all inflated and strong. Okay. <laughs> Let's go with that. So, okay, last last question from, from the audience before we wrap up here. Uh, this is interesting because we've talked to actors who have replaced or reprised a role a famous role if there's like a remake or something and a lot of times they feel awkward or there's certain amount of pressure by stepping into you know a role that was made famous by you know Catherine Hepburn or somebody this big name what is it like for for you with with voice acting I mean is there any amount of pressure or do you feel like you have to follow any kind of suit when you're stepping into a role like Simba or or like He-Man or, or or even you've done Green Lantern I mean you've done a lot of roles that are very characters are very well known Professor so, X from the X-Files Professor X right from the from the X-Men is there any kind of, of Did I say X-Files or the X-Men X-Men that is concerning or pressure do you feel pressure when you have to step into something like that I never have how about that um I mean you hired me so I you know what you're looking for right and um I just never thought what we did was such a big deal that anyone you know would care um they, uh, He-Man was made in Canada and they couldn't, they wanted the same actor to do both Prince Adam and He-Man and they could not find anyone so they came to the States and auditioned and I uh, I'm, I had, have quite a good range from high school you know, to senior mm-hmm. I, I, I can really, you know, fan that out and I got it and I just went, cool I mean, it, it didn't enter my mind now I'm a hot mess in my real life, but as far as the <laughs> word goes, I, I, I was never, uh, that, that never would cross my mind. I sometimes wondered about longevity, and I'd be jealous that I didn't, uh, more, it was like, I'd be jealous that I didn't get a certain job. Mm-hmm. I never feared that I was, had, had, a, re- had somebody else's reputation I had to deal with when I got something, but I did. Yeah, I had... I would get, there were many jobs I really wanted and they didn't come my way, you know? Right. And that's that's when I would get, mm, but never in uh, playing a role because I trusted the producers that they, they chose me because they, they wanted me, so don't talk to me, talk to them if right. you don't like it. Right. Well, you certainly made a living at doing this, but it would have been cool if you could have been, of course, you'd be old now or maybe even dead, which is not so cool, but if you'd have been born earlier, you could have totally been in the old-time radio thing. That would have been a big open field for you. I would have loved that. Yeah. You know, would have loved that. Actually, my dream job would have been to have been born about 50 years earlier and direct variety television. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Direct <laughs> what I was born. You know, Carol Burnett, Sonny and Cher, Flip Wilson, King Family, uh, to just do a play every week, a different play every week. 
Well, I I know that you did this, okay? And I don't know, is there like a DVD recording or, or something? Uh, your your one-man show you did. I would love to see that. Uh, yes, yeah, shameful plug. Uh, Stop Me If I Told You This is the one-man show based on my life. Um, the ups and downs, the emotional tragedies um, of... Uh, uh, being gay in a Mormon community mm -hmm. and dealing with all that and all that I had to go through and as well as old clips and from the King family. Anyway, you it's stop me if I told you this and you can find it on my on my website. Okay. At uh Cam Clark Voices or camclark.com. Uh it is there and I'm very proud of it. Um uh uh, uh yeah. So check that out. It's just 90 minutes, so don't worry. <laughs> my, my it has clips of my dad. Fantastic. It has clips of the King family. It has clips of the cartoons. And, you know, it's all over the map. And it was um, just really hard work, but I, I'm very proud of it. My, my favorite moment of a video you posted on Facebook was when you and Tina went to visit the old boyhood home where you're standing outside. And you had said to her that you were admitting that you had a crush on Don Grady, and she goes so oh, yeah. she goes so did I. <laughs> <laughs> well, they were they were lovers, right? So yeah, for that, sure. Yeah, yeah, but uh, who didn't have a crush on Don Grady? That's yeah, right, that's true. exactly. Oh, that's true. It's been delightful. We have to sit down sometime and share stories of uh, people that you grew up loving. Like somebody from Dark Shadows, and I miss I miss school to watch every day, and flunked grades only to have her call me on the phone and scream at me, and I won't say who it was. But but Hollywood can be cruel, but then Hollywood can be nice too, and you appreciate your fans, and that's really a good thing because you know that's part of uh, what makes you cool because you got to be that way. These you gotta are give back. people yeah. that that put you where you are, you know. Yeah, it's very humbling to go to these comic cons, and I dug my heels in. Rob Paulson, who replaced me in Johnny <laughs> Quest, begged me, begged me to do them. And I'm like, I don't want to. I don't like people enough. <laughs> and they're, 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 they're hard work. Yeah. You know, uh, it's hard work to, to pay attention. You know, I'm, I'll be honest. It's not easy to give all these, to listen to all these people's stories as, you know, it's, you got to focus. Yep. Well, and, and what I th what I think people don't realize is how ex exhausting it is, not only emotionally and mentally, but physically too. Like we never ran the convention circuit, but we've done uh, radio remotes from a few conventions, and we were friends with um, actor Sid Haig, who did run the convention circuit. And we used to get to the venue at six, seven a.m., and he was already there sleeping on the couch because he was exhausted from work. doing the convention the night before. Yeah. It's, it's, it's hard work because also in animation, I know you're wrapping up, but a lot of our fans are, and I don't, you know, I don't know what's PC to say, uh, but a lot of our fans are, quote, on the spectrum. Right. Okay? And I never had dealings with that in my personal life. Um, but you have these people, these adults who come with their adult children who they are taking care of mm -hmm. to one degree or another and they say you are the one place where my child connected outside of the inside of his head mm -hmm. um, and that's humbling and that makes it all worthwhile when people who are marginalized find a happy place and if you're a part of that yeah you think that's something you might ever go into I mean if you ever kind of retire from the voice acting or whatever to trying to reach autistic children or you know something people that you could oh help. I like when I retire I'd like to reach myself <laughs> <laughs> well I think you definitely know who you are and, and, and that's, that's for sure yes. yeah, it helps I'm worth 90 million dollars <laughs> that's all I know and, and you're a voice actor that's not schizophrenic because so believe me there nice. are, there are some that are and there, there's some there's some crazy fans too and, and you got to know how to deal with well, it but. you've not seen me with my sock puppet right. so. <laughs> 
All just right. leave you with that image. Well, I hope you get this uh, this King Family thing going, this uh, live show. Yeah. Because, you know, hopefully things are good. Have you gotten inoculated yet? I've got to ask you because everybody's always asking. I'm double back. There you, there you go. go. There you go. <laughs> I have yet to get enough balls to be able to go out and do that. And it's that. not that he doesn't want to do it. He just doesn't <clears throat> want to go what? out. He no, we want to get the vaccine, but Terry doesn't want to go out and be around people to get the vaccine. You have to go <laughs> out and expose yourself to possibly catching it to be able to get the shot because you're around oh, them. Oh good lord. They're, they're they're touching you. They're touching you and Yeah. And, yeah. So. See what I deal with, Cam? Well, maybe Leonardo <laughs> can give you the shot because then you'll have turtle power if you're double vaccine. There you go. All right. It is. Have we got through all your friends' questions? Yes, okay, yes. It has been such a pleasure chatting with you, Cam. I encourage all of our listeners, head over to Cam's website. It's a gorgeous website over at camclark.com. And uh, thank you, Cam. It's been, a, it's been a delightful hour. Yeah, and I had you on oh, because you're thank highly you guys entertaining. Thank you for having me on. I had what? you on because I thought you were highly entertaining. I thought maybe you could get me a date with your cousin Tina, but that <laughs> probably won't happen. But. Well, I don't know. Send me your 8 by 10 <laughs> And get your damn shot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's <for> yeah. Sure. <laughs> All right. Uh, a website. we got to tell people his yeah, website. Cam oh, you did say it. Okay, I very did. good. Yes. Do, you, do you do the autograph thing for people if they want to have something signed? And Yep. Very good. It's all there. All right. all right. Thank you again, Cam. Have a great rest of your weekend. Did you have fun dancing on American Dream? I did. Okay, I'll give you. I'll give you one other quick story. Tell the quick story that. about Dick yeah, Clark. So the... I was one of the band. I was one of the bandstand dancers that was the regulars. We would get called in two to three days a week uh, for every season. I started on season one for the, for the television show or for bandstand itself. For, no, for American Dreams. It was NBC for series. Dreams. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. American Dreams. So I was one of the bandstand mm-hmm. dancers on that and, you know, started with season one, blah, blah, blah. So then, it, of course, they went through a third-party casting group. Um, when we went to hiatus, came back for season two, I was waiting, you know, for the call. All of the other dancers that I knew had been called back, but I hadn't been called yet. So I called the the casting director... And I, or I just said, hey, you know what? I was just curious, just following up on this. And she pulled up my picture, and she was like, oh, yeah, no, you won't be returning because you're too fat. And I, oh. I was like, what? She goes, yeah, no, we need people that are like a size six, and you're over a size six, so you're too fat. You won't be coming back for season two. Well, um... I didn't accept that because that was crass. Like, I get in Hollywood, like, you get rejection all the time. Um, But I had heard from, I mean, at this point, I had been on the show for a year, and I was friends with the producers and, you know, Jonathan Prince and the directors and all of this kind of stuff. And they had all said, you're coming back. So I actually called Jonathan Prince's and Dick Clark's offices. And I said, hey, I just was following up. I just wanted to find out if this was right. And they called me back. Jonathan Prince's office called me back and was like, what exactly did she say to you? And I told him. And uh, long story short, I was back on the series the next week, and that casting director was no longer involved. Wow. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> it was hard for us to deal with the fact that, you know, it was supposed to be a recreation of a show that was done back in the day in Philadelphia, and then it moved out to L.A., but started out in Philadelphia, that every girl on that show that was back on the real show was all picture perfect Hollywood looking and all a little petite, you know. That that's a bunch of baloney. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but I indeed. but actually being on the show, I absolutely loved it. That was my life for a good few years. And you know, you, you kind of get engrossed in it when you have to be on set at five in the morning with curlers in your hair so that they can do a beehive on you. So yeah. <laughs> but but it was fun. It was <laughs> a lot of fun. And she oh, even good. she even got her dad on the show. I got to be on the show and I, I got to dance with a fake Shirelle, so that was <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> yeah, excellent. <laughs> I did not know that you did voices for it, though. I did. I was in the loop group. Oh, fantastic! So, in a way, Cam, we've worked together. Yes, indeed. <laughs> six degrees, six degrees of Kevin Bacon. That's right. That's right. Now, you ought to put out a book like. Your life story. I know you did a one-man play, but you should do it. Yeah, watch the play. Yeah, Yeah. there you go. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Again, everyone, check out Cam's website, camclark.com. And, Cam, you have my contact information. Keep in touch. Anything comes up in the future that, uh, you know, if the tribute gets together or any other project you'd like to promote, just shoot me an email. We'd love to have you back on. Yeah, we live in in the mountains in uh, Lake Hughes, and we would love to have you and your cousin Tina out here. 
because that would be fun sometime once everything gets done being crazy. What's Lake Hughes? Uh, we're up in the Angeles National Forest, so oh, yeah, cool. we live we live cool, up in cool. the up in not, the not wooded areas, up from Santa Clarita. Yeah, yeah, got it. Yeah, beautiful. All right, All right we All will right. we will keep in touch. Thank you again, Cam. All right, thanks, kids. All right, have a great rest of your weekend. Bye. 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 You too.